next few minutes, we're going to be talking about exercise-associated hyponatremia at the Western States Endurance Run. Thanks for joining me. My name is Marty Hoffman. I'm the Director of Research at the Western States Endurance Run. Exercise-associated hyponatremia has been a focus area of research at the run for the last couple of years. Race Director Greg Soderlin had asked me to share with you some, some of the, the recent information we've learned from our research, uh, information that will impact our recommendations about medical management at the run. First, I'd like to start by sharing with you the key points I'd like to make today. First off, exercise-associated hyponatremia is common at the Western States Endurance Run and can occur, and often does occur, in the dehydrated state. As a result, change in body weight cannot be used as an indication of whether one is likely to have exercise-associated hyponatremia. Secondly, IV hydration with normal saline can cause blood sodium concentrations to drop further in a runner with exercise-associated hyponatremia. As a result, use of IV normal saline in a collapsed runner without knowing blood sodium concentration should be done only with extreme caution. Finally, weight loss of over 5% is common, even among the top performers. So this level of weight loss should not necessarily be a concern. Exercise associated hyponatremia by definition is the occurrence of hyponatremia or blood sodium concentrations below 135 millimoles per liter during or up to 24 hours after prolonged physical activity. The signs and symptoms are shown here. Early on there can be bloating, puffiness especially of the hands and the face, nausea, vomiting, and headache. Later on, we see the development of altered mental status, uh, leading to seizures and respiratory distress, and if gone untreated, coma and death. This is what we, we see. Uh, fluid in the lungs or pulmonary edema, or brain swelling or cere cerebral edema. This is what we want to avoid. Unfortunately, there are some shared symptoms between exercise-associated hyponatremia and dehydration. These include fatigue, altered mental status, headache, nausea, and vomiting. The question has arisen, what about using body weight to assist in, in the diagnosis of exercise-associated hyponatremia? Let me share with you some of our data uh, from recent races. Uh, these are from three 100-mile races in Northern California, the Rio del Lago from 2008 and the 2009 and the 2010 Western States Endurance Runs. What we have here are 223 separate observations and just to orient you to the graph, we have plotted the post-race serum sodium concentration as a function of the percent change in body mass. Now we've also sectioned off the graph uh, in such a way that we have the overhydrated group, that's the group that has, has gained body mass. Euhydration is defined as body mass loss up to 3% and dehydration is body mass loss beyond 3%. I've also sectioned this off in terms of sodium state. Normal blood sodium is between 135 and 145, so we call that normal natremia. Above 145 is hypernatremia. Between 129 and 135 is what we term biochemical hyponatremia. And then below 129 is clinically significant hyponatremia. 
So what, what, with that orientation, what can we see from this, uh, this graph? First off, the, the major point we can make is that 33.3% uh, of the observations here had exercise-associated hyponatremia. In other words, one out of three of the runners that we tested were hyponatremic at the finish. Secondly, the, the relationship between post-race sodium concentration and change in body mass was non-significant. That's shown here with this dark, uh, solid black line. Uh, but the, this relationship was non-significant. In other words, there, there was no relationship between the post-race serum sodium and change in body mass. And finally, if we look specifically at, at this group here, the group that's, uh, that has exercise-associated hyponatremia and is also dehydrated, we found that, that they accounted for 45% of those with exercise-associated hyponatremia. In other words, uh, of those with exercise-associated hyponatremia, 45%, almost half of them, had body mass loss of over 3%. Therefore, it's pretty clear that we can't use an increase in body mass as a guide for the diagnosis of exercise-associated hyponatremia. Now, what happens if we give IV normal saline to a runner who's hyponatremic? This, this is a case from the 2009 Western States Endurance Run uh, that we published on in the uh, Wilderness and Emergency Medicine Journal uh, just recently. Uh, this individual showed up at the finish line, uh, came to the medical tent, had a serum sodium concentration of 134. He was treated with IV hydration, he received a total of four liters of normal saline over the course of seven hours. And you can see what happened with his blood sodium concentration, it went down. At this point, he, he was actually looking reasonably well and he was released. Uh, and he went uh, to his hotel and a few hours later ended up in the emergency room where his blood sodium concentration at that time was only 30. They did the same thing, they treated him aggressively with IV normal saline. Once again, you can see what happened to his blood sodium concentration. So these are the sort of drops in blood sodium concentration that, that could potentially set someone over into cerebral edema. And we have to be really careful uh, with this sort of treatment. Let me show you another case. This is a case from the 2010 Western States endurance run. This runner showed up at the finish with a blood sodium concentration of 120. She was treated appropriately, receiving a bolus of 100 cc's of 3% normal saline, so hypertonic saline. And you can see what happened to her sodium. It went up a little bit. Uh, this was about one hour later. She was still um, not looking particularly good at this point, even though her sodium was up, and she was not able to urinate. So she was sent to the emergency room, and by the time she got there, her sodium was up even further, and she urinated excessively at this point, which was, was a good thing, uh, the right thing, the right physiological response, and um, uh, really didn't receive any uh, treatment at the hospital. Uh, because we were doing studies uh, that year, we, we measured AVP or arginine vasopressin and we actually got uh, these measures uh, at the finish and 60 minutes after she received this treatment. Now AVP is a hormone that helps uh, regulate sodium and osmolality and with the blood osmolalities that would be present with a, a sodium concentration of 120, AVP should be completely suppressed. 
In other words, it, it should not be measurable. However, her AVP was up, and we, we know that, that there are potent stimuli for AVP secretion associated with, with these events. Uh, those, those stimuli include exercise, heat, and nausea. Nausea is especially um, potent at uh, causing the uh, secretion of AVP. Uh, so her AVP was, was elevated um, at, at both time points here. We, we did not get a blood at, at this point because she was no longer accessible to us, but uh, we can be pretty certain that her AVP was suppressed at this point because she uh, was able to urinate. 